<laughs> Thank you. Um, I've learned recently that it's best to be genuine and heartfelt with our land acknowledgements. And sometimes I find that's difficult when we have these provincial calls and trying to acknowledge everybody across the province, which I can't do. So today I'm gonna to acknowledge the land where I am. And I invite you to have the heartfelt acknowledgement in, in the chat um, for where you are. Uh, and I think that might work better moving forward. And in the future, if there's anyone who would like to do a land acknowledgement uh, and share some information and knowledge about where you are, um, please reach out and we can, we can look at that because it seems like I always do this and we can share um, that role. So uh, I'm located in what is known today as Salmon Arm, which is on Chequatin territory. And um, Chequatin territory is a nation of, oh my goodness, my phone. Um, is 32 uh, nations originally, uh, or communities, sorry, they're Salish speaking communities, and they were divided into 17 bands uh, by the Indian Act. Today, they have a population of approximately 10,000 people, and pre contact, they had an estimated 25,000 people. And uh, they were reduced uh, to 7,000 by the 1862 smallpox. Wow. Uh, their territory spans approximately 180,000 square kilometers. And uh, they, the territory includes the headwaters of both the Fraser and the Columbia rivers. They have occupied their territory for over 10,000 years. They have never signed away, ceded or sold their land or their territory. And it's with humility and respect that I acknowledge the traditional ancestral and, uh, and unceded Chequatin territory. Um, yeah. So with that, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Uh, please, I see people are adding there, so that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so we're doing today's presentation because we've talked a while about, everyone has um, an interest in climate and health. We've been talking about it quite a bit. We've had presentations. I think a year ago we had uh, Dr. Henderson present and we're interested in knowing what are other people doing. We're working in this system. We all have um, a passion for this area and interest, but how do we fit in with everything else? Uh, and so that's what today's presentation is about. Not everyone, we're, we're, in the, we're, we're in a boat in a stormy sea that sometimes things happen and we're building the boat as we're sailing. And so not everyone today has the answers, but we're all trying to figure out things moving forward. Um, I'd just like to tell a little bit of a story about the Chequatin Landmarks Project. Um, so in the Shuswap region where I am, there was recognition that there isn't a lot on the land giving history and traditions about the Chequatin people. And a group of people, came together or they were already together doing trails work, but they recognized this. And today there is a project, um, I'll pop into the chat here, there's an article about it. And what it is, is uh, an art project or an art um, large project where we're gonna have landmarks throughout this region that demonstrate or show, um, identify important landmarks to the peoples that have been here for many years and social history. And it's some reconciliation between the Chequatin people and the non Chequatin people that are in this region. Uh, and this idea started with two people having an idea and they grew that and they created support with others. And they're now contributing to a larger, bigger systems change. They had to be open to learning and working with each other in order to do this. And they didn't know what it looked like when they started. And it has grown along the way and has been guided by elders, um, community leaders, uh, in, includes youth. And so it's kind of brought a whole umbrella of people together. And so I'm telling this story as a way to suggest that um, collectively, we don't know the details of how we're, all of this is going to work out. Uh, but I encourage you 
to be innovative, connect with each other, and take your small ideas and see how we can blossom them into the big, uh, a bigger project and see how it fits in. So today when we're listening and learning, we can think about your work, your community, your network of people that you work with. Um, how do you fit in with others? And how do we fit in with this broader um, approach that's happening? And so um, we're going to see sort of the overarching work that's happening. And hopefully by the end of it, we won't have a clear picture, but there might be pieces of the picture that are a little bit clearer in how we fit together. And just have an understanding that all of this is still a work in progress. Okay, so you know, with that, um, I would just like to uh, introduce Mary Cameron. Um, Mary Cameron is the inaugural director uh, of the Ministry of Health's new climate resilience program situated within the population and public health division. And since 2013, Mary has been collaborating with health authorities and other partners on provincial environmental health policies at the Ministry of Health. Previously as a senior scientist uh, in the uh, health protection branch. Prior to joining the BC government, Mary was a research associate and epidemiologist with the University of Ottawa's Institute of Population Health, supporting Indigenous-led community-based research. She has a master's of science in epidemiology and community medicine and a bachelor in human, or sorry, bachelor of science in human biology. Mary lives in Victoria and is grateful to be raising her two young children on the beautiful Lekwungen territory. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mary, and um, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, I'm wondering, uh, let me know when the slides are ready to go. But in the meantime, I just really appreciate your, your words, Anita, and, and acknowledgement that this is, um, it's a big space to be um, venturing into. And I think um, many of us are, are daunted and overwhelmed by the enormity of climate change and the impact that's having on, on health and, and health systems uh, here in BC. So here, I'm, here I am today humbly um, going to tell you a little bit about some uh, foundational initial steps that we are taking here in the ministry uh, and, and with our health authority partners and others to um, work within our realm of influence to do what we can in this space. So um, as Anita mentioned, my name is Mary Cameron. I'm the director of the Climate Resilience Program here at the Ministry of Health. We're a, a brand new program, just um, less than a year uh, in, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So before I begin, I want to acknowledge with deep gratitude and respect that I'm speaking to you today from the territory of the Lekwungen peoples, known as the Sanjis and Esquimalt First Nations, and the home of the Métis Chartered Community of Greater Victoria. We know that BC's Indigenous communities are uniquely and disproportionately impacted by the health risks of climate change. And I want to take this moment to recognize and honor the climate resilience and leadership of BC's Indigenous communities and nations that have been stewarding these lands since time immemorial. I'd also like to express my team's commitment to learning and unlearning as we collectively work to decolonize and enhance the cultural safety of health policies and services here in BC. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd share this um, quote before I begin. I really appreciate this quote from Dr. Bonnie Henry, our, our provincial health officer. And it, it really speaks to what indigenous peoples have been telling us for, for generations. And that's that our physical, social, economic, uh, and mental health and well-being are inextricably connected to our climate and the health of our environment. And this is integral and central to the work that we'll be doing uh, together through this program. So today I'll tell you a little bit about um, why health sector leadership and climate action is important, some adaptation strategies uh, that are in place um, and recently released in, in BC and at the national level. I'll tell you a little bit about our new climate resilience program and the importance of understanding and assessing the health impacts of climate change in, in terms of developing policy and protecting health, and specifically about a project called the Risk to Resilience Project, which is um, uh, a project we have underway to, to help 
help uh, take that first step to get us there to understanding those impacts and opportunities for action. Next steps, our next slide, please. So um, what is our role? What is the Climate Resilience uh, Program? So we are, um, the ministry develops strategic policy for the health system and, and stewardship over the health system in partnership with health authorities, which uh, implement the services and, and, and policies um, at, within their respective regions. So our program here is leading provincial strategic policy and initiatives, focusing on protecting and promoting population health and health system climate resilience working in collaboration, of course, with our BC health authorities and other partners. And I look forward to introducing you to some of our, our health authority climate and health leads that we're working closely with in this work. Next slide, please. So there's increasing recognition and awareness that climate change is not just an environmental health issue or environmental issue, and that the health sector really has a critical role to play. We know that health is central to climate action. The World Health Organization has declared climate change to be the single greatest health threat to humanity. And while our work here in the Climate Resilience Program is focused primarily on preparedness and adaptation and resilience, I want to acknowledge um, that the health sector is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and waste and has an important role to play in slowing the progression of climate change. And therefore, the health sector um, mitigation as well as adaptation measures are critical, and these need to be uh, aligned and coordinated. And in fact, that's um, that's one of the guiding principles of the climate adaptation strategy, which I'll be telling you about. Population health impacts. So, as the, the climate change continues, uh, as climate continues to change, health risks will increase from more frequent and intense extreme weather events and through impacts to air, water, food, infectious and vector borne disease, and to mental health. We know that some populations are more affected by climate change, Indigenous populations, as well as rural, remote, and underserved uh, communities, can experience unique or disproportionate impacts further exacerbating existing inequities. We're also seeing compounding pressures on the health system. So climate related shocks and stressors can exert significant demand and burden on BC's health system through damage to infrastructure, service disruption, hospital surges and pressures on healthcare providers. We're seeing um, a new enabling policy environment for climate preparedness and adaptation strategy that we haven't seen before here in BC. So climate readiness is a strategic priority for the BC government, including adaptation measures that will be critical to reducing health risks and pressures on the health system now and into the future. Having strong evidence and accountability measures are important. Understanding the risks to health and tracking progress will be vital to understanding and advancing effective, equitable and responsive actions. And finally, leadership and governance is um, the critical component and essential ingredient to advancing this work. So health authorities and health service providers have really been leading the way in this space. And so um, while we are a new program, I in no way want to suggest that, um, that this work is new. This work has been um, uh, advancing and being led at a, a regional and local level um, for many years. And so I um, really wanna uh, express my gratitude and, and acknowledge that. But we're, we're clear that a coordinated approach and shared understanding is really needed to scale up action urgently and to ensure we're working in coordination and alignment. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our program is being born out of the Provincial Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy, which was released in June of last year. And, um, and that is uh, that strategy is what's funding our program and the, the climate and health leads that you'll be meeting um, later on in, in this webinar. So the climate preparedness and adaptation strategy is a core component of the Clean BC Climate Action Plan, which is being led by the Climate Action Secretariat within the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. The strategy consists of four pathways for action, which includes um, safe and healthy communities. It also highlights the need for cross-sectoral collaboration and an all of society approach. And health is just one of multiple ministries from across the provincial government that's participating in the strategy. On the right-hand side, you'll see that there are um, six key guiding principles um, under the strategy, including protecting health and well-being, a shared path to climate resilience with indigenous peoples, 
and an equity informed approach. Next slide, please. I also wanna mention that um, the federal government recently released their national adaptation strategy uh, this past November. And that strategy includes objectives for health and well-being, which support and complement those of our objectives under the provincial climate preparedness and adaptation strategy. And we're working closely with Health Canada to align and leverage our work under the two strategies. So that includes building expertise, knowledge and resources to identify risks and take action, monitoring health impacts and progress, protecting population health, and cross-sectoral climate action to promote health. Next slide, please. So our Climate Resilience Program was form formally established following the release of the Provincial Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy in June of last year. And since that time, we've been working with health authorities and other partners to identify the areas where we can add the greatest value to scale up health sector climate action. So we know that this is an enormous, um, an enormous issue that, that we're all grappling with uh, um, here in BC and, and worldwide. So what can we be doing within our realm of influence, within the ministry and within the health authorities um, to take action and, and build climate resilience? So uh, some key goals that our program here at the ministry is looking to advance include strengthening health sector leadership and governance for climate preparedness and adaptation, enhancing health workforce knowledge, capacity and resources so that they're equipped to anticipate, prevent, prepare for and respond to climate risks enhancing knowledge, data, and evidence for effective and equitable policies, programs, and services to promote population health and health system climate resilience, empowering BC communities and the public to prepare for and adapt to the health impacts of climate change, and systematically integrating climate and health considerations into policies, programs, and services to enhance resilience, responsiveness, and adaptive capacity. Next slide, please. So you may be wondering, what do we mean by a climate resilient health system? Um, I'd like to share this definition from the World Health Organization's operational framework for building climate resilient health systems, which defines climate resilient health systems as, as having the capacity to anticipate, respond, cope, recover, and adapt to climate related shocks and stresses, and to improve population health despite an unstable climate. And this framework really stresses the importance of a systems approach to building resilience, recognizing that all areas of the health system have a role to play. So you'll see right there at the top that leadership and governance is um, central and integral to this, um, to advancing climate resilience, um, but also requires um, action around health workforce, health information systems, essential medical products and technologies, service delivery and financing. And as this definition recognizes, the resilience of communities and the protection of public health is highly influenced by the resilience of the health system and vice versa. Next slide, please. So um, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce our climate resilience team here in the ministry. Um, they are here today. I know we don't have time to do a round table, but I'm really looking forward to you getting to know them as we advance this work. Um, Rebecca, Anna, Sally and Anders are the most passionate, talented, and dedicated public servants I know, and they bring just incredible expertise in the area of climate change, health policy, public health, epidemiology, and monitoring and evaluation. And they're just really awesome humans. So I'm really um, looking forward to getting to know them. Uh, this is a picture from our uh, from our Christmas party, what I cropped out was our amazing um, gingerbread house. We had a gingerbread house making competition with the ministry and we won, I think it was the low carbon climate resilient, um, the most low carbon climate resilient gingerbread house complete with um, uh, a community garden and uh, solar panels. So it was pretty awesome. I actually should have included it in the photo, but anyhow, meet the team. They are amazing and look forward to working with them. Uh, next slide, please. So implementation of our CPAS commitments uh, will be occurring through a coordinated approach across multiple health agencies. This includes the ministry, the BC Centre for Disease Control, First Nations Health Authority, and all five regional health authorities. 
and in alignment with the cross-sectoral all of society approach of the provincial strategy that we're working within, each agency will be working with their respective partners at the federal, provincial and regional and local level to advance shared priorities for climate resilience. So as many of the opportunities to protect health and build resilience lie beyond the authority and realm of influence of the Ministry of Health and Health Authorities, it'll be essential that we work with um, a diverse range of partners and sectors uh, to advance this work. Next slide, please. So this is a graphic from the World Health Organization that that shows that the health impacts of climate change are influenced by the level and nature of exposure to climate hazards, the sensitivity and susceptibility of populations, and the adaptive capacity of communities as well as health systems. So understanding these relationships and connections in BC is critical to developing policies, programs, and services that are effective, equitable, and responsive. So that includes seeking answers to questions such as, which populations and regions are most impacted by the health risks of climate change and why, which climate hazards pose the greatest health risk in BC, how is BC's health sector preparing, adapting and responding, how can our policies, programs and services be more effective, equitable and responsive, and what are the outcomes that we're seeing here in BC with respect to health and health system impacts. Next slide please. So through the um, CPAS, as we call it, or the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy, each health authority will be conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments to better understand the risks and ad adaptive capacity specific to their region and organization. The ministry will be working alongside BC CDC to provide provincial level support, coordination and evidence to support those regional assessments. And one project that we have underway is our risk to resilience project, which is um, attempting to take stock of what we know and just as importantly, what we don't know about climate change and health here in BC. And that is working to provide a, a foundation and evidence base to inform regional assessments and also to identify needs and priorities for the climate resilience moving forward. That includes understanding knowledge gaps and where we need to be digging deeper. So specifically key objectives of the project are to synthesize um, knowledge on climate and health risk and resilience here in BC, building public and health sector knowledge, identifying effective, equitable and responsive practices to build resilience. Key activities include a literature review and evidence review, partner engagement, training and capacity building and knowledge translation activities. Outputs include um, a report of our, our findings, case studies and stories of resilience of work happening across, here, across BC to build that resilience, knowledge translation products, capacity building tools and resources. And the intended outcomes are to better understand um, uh, the knowledge in this area, as well as the, the knowledge gaps, enhancing public and health sector awareness, developing an evidence base to inform policy action and further assessments, and building and sparking those partner connections and collaborations that are so critical to this work. Next slide, please. So we're working with our contractor, um, Shift Collaborative, to implement the project, which is running from fall of 2022 until March of 2024. Key activities and um, data collection engagement include uh, comprehensive literature and document review, key informant interviews, focus groups, and Indigenous sharing circles, collecting stories from the field or stories of resilience to better understand the experience and perspectives of key partners and service providers, and knowledge translation products and activities to communicate findings, including presentations, workshops, and the final report. And next slide, please. So that's um, the end of my presentation. I've um, really enjoyed being here today and I'm really excited to, to introduce you to some of the climate and health leads that we're working with, but I've included our email here if you'd like to learn more about our work. Um, or about the Risk to Resilience project, um, please reach out. We'd um, love to speak with you. And uh, I don't, would you like me to take questions now or launch right into the intro introductions? Well, you're a minute early. Maybe I'll take one question and then we could launch in. You're, you're 
right on time. So that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for your presentation. That was uh, I really, your slides were great and easy to understand. And thank you. Does anyone have a question? You can either type it into the chat uh, or at the, otherwise at the very end, we'll have a question, a longer question answer period for, for everybody. But if anyone has a burning question right away, we can start with that. Oh, I see a hand. Uh, Jules D. Oh, hello. Oh, we can't hear you. You're still on mute. <laughs> hi. Just hello. To we can hi. hear you now. Yeah. I am um, attending from uh, Whitby, Ontario. And I'm just wondering, do you know of anybody at all who's doing this work in, in this area that I could probably connect with? In Ontario? Yes. Yes, we'd be happy to connect you. That um, would be great. Thank you. There, um, I'm, I'm not, there's, there'll be a similar, a similar, but different approach in Ontario. There's a lot of really great work happening in Ontario. Um, I, I'm not aware of a, of a similar kind of parallel program, but there's okay. some really great work happening there. Either that or to, I can move to BC. Come on down. We'd love, <laughs> love to have you here. Yes. Um, please reach out and we could, um, connect you with some, some key folks. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Right. I'm mute again. Sorry. Um, well, thank you for your question. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, okay, so Mary, do you want to sort of launch into the, the next phase and, and introduce our leads? Yeah, sure. So one thing I might have might not have made clear or acknowledged um, in my presentation is that, I mean, I did mention that this is a new program area for us and there's been work happening um, for many years in this space. But for many, many years, um, many of us, including myself, have been trying to embed climate change and advanced climate action really off the sides of our desk. And we really haven't had the space um, and capacity to, to carve out um, dedicated space for this work. And so um, the climate preparedness and adaptation strategy is um, an admittedly modest, but incredible step for us um, in the ministry and health authorities, uh, an opportunity to, to carve a space for this work and something that we can build upon together. So. Um, with that, we do have um, some funding through the strategy to build my team and then um, uh, teams in or staff within the, the health authorities as well. So each health authority um, will have a climate and health lead that will be um, tasked and tagged and responsible for implementing the CPAS accountabilities and commitments within their respective organizations. Um, and they'll be working alongside alongside my team and through uh, a climate preparedness and adaptation strategy when we got a health advisory committee or the CPAS hack. We don't usually do the full name because it sounds ridiculous. Um, so we work through that committee to, to try and coordinate um, our work together as best we can. And then um, uh, so it's really some of the, the teams are are in place now and others are still under under development. This is really a, a new space, as I mentioned. So um, uh, really excited. This is our first time kind of presenting um, as, as a full group. So that's um, pretty cool. Uh, first in, in uh, First Nations Health Authority, we have uh, Mary Kaplan Hallam, which is the climate health, um, climate change and health adaptation specialist there. In, BC, in BCC, BCCDC, we have Adam Cassidy and Angela Yao. Um, in Northern Health, we have Diana Kutzner. In Interior, we have Katie Hunter. In Vancouver Coastal, uh, Craig Brown, who is the first climate change and health lead in, in, uh, in the regional health authorities. Of course, Mary Kaplan. I actually don't know if Mary and Craig, who was first? Anyhow, no, I think FNHA might have been first, actually. Sorry, Craig. Um, and then uh, Fraser Health, um, today I believe we have Amy Lubick or Sandra uh, Gill joining us, and then from Island Health, um, Lois um, Gavitos, I think I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Lois just started um, like a couple of weeks ago, I think. So with that, um, maybe I'll hand it over to the panel to introduce themselves. That's great, thank you. And so it looks like we have um, uh, Mary uh, joining us first with the FNHA and she's gonna speak for a little bit and then we'll pass on to, to each one and, and uh, 
for to say a few words. Some some are saying a few more than others, <laughs> depending on how long they've been in the position and and how um, how much they have to share. Is Mary on? Is she there somewhere? No. Yes, better if I. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, hi. If I project, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, okay. hi, welcome. Thank you. Please Good. take it away. All right. So this is an adequate level that I'm projecting at now. Okay. So no whispering. That's fine. Um, thanks, Anita. Thanks, Mary. Um, my name is Mary Kaplan Hallam. Um, increasingly referred to as the other Mary in these kinds of conversations. So we'll have to figure out something better. Um, than that moving forward. But uh, I'm the climate change and health adaptation specialist, as Mary said, um, for the First Nations Health Authority, um, uh, which is playing a, a different unique role in the CPAS process than the other regional health authorities, um, as you'll hear um, when people describe their, their work. But just by way of situating myself as an individual first, I'll share that I'm a fourth generation settler of mixed uh, European and South African ancestry, um, but I was incredibly fortunate to grow up uh, as an uninvited guest on different parts of Coast Salish territory, and today I'm calling in from my home office, which is located on unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations um, in what's also known today as Vancouver. Uh, and I'm I'm not going to assume the uh, level of familiarity uh, folks on the call will have with FNHA, so uh, might start by describing just that FNHA is a provincial scale, um, not-for-profit organization that plans, designs, manages, and provides funding for um, the delivery of First Nations health programs and services across BC. Um, including, but also beyond, um, services formerly delivered by Health Canada. Um, so FNHA is a one component of a larger First Nations health governance structure that we have in BC, um, unique to BC, um, and, and sits alongside uh, the First Nations Health Council um, and also First Nations uh, Health Directors Association. Um, so uh, also important, I think, in these conversations, in this kind of space to uh, note that FNHA's work doesn't replace the responsibilities of uh, the Ministry of Health and of regional health authorities for First Nations, um, including First Nations living in community, um, which is to say as well that as an organization, really, that was intentional, Anita. <laughs> um, uh, just saying that... Um, really rely on partnerships then um, to ensure that communities do get the full breadth uh, and scope of the things that they need and um, certainly see that that includes programs and services related to the kinds of climate change and health topics that we're talking about um, today. So um, my, my position is on um, a central environmental public health services team um, alongside teams like health emergency management, um, and uh, that means that I get to work with all of the regions um, in terms of FNHA's regional teams sitting in different portfolios, um, but also with First Nation communities and organizations um, across the province. And um, hopefully it would go without saying that I don't speak on behalf of um, any First Nations, but, but also um, because of the scale of conversation here, um, want to say that as a central position, I also don't um, attempt to speak on behalf of or cover all of the um, amazing work that happens in FNHA's regional teams who have their own uh, localized initiatives and capabilities and relationships. And so uh, after this call, um, certainly ha very happy for folks here to contact me if you don't feel like you have um, connections to the right folks in your region, um, and I'll support that um, in any way I can. Um, so uh, some of the, the colleagues on the panel here are uh, in, in new climate health roles, as Mary mentioned, but my, my position has existed at FNHA for a few years now, um, and it was actually established with a focus on developing um, and delivering FNHA's uh, Indigenous Climate Health Action Program, um, which is we refer to as ICHAP, just to continue um, the acronym um, party here. 
Uh, and ICHAP provides funding to community-led climate action projects, um, but with that focus on health and wellness outcomes as being a key component. Um, and, and through ICHAP uh, over the past couple of years, uh, FNHA has been able to support uh, close to 50 community-led projects um, across the province and uh, covering really wide range of climate health themes um, to support different priorities. So those range from climate health risk assessments and action planning uh, that folks here will be increasingly aware of, um, uh, indigenous food security and sovereignty projects, uh, but also, um, also initiatives like monitoring how traditional ecological indicators might be changing um, as a result of climate-driven changes or um, work to ensure that uh, traditional knowledge and language are preserved um, as, uh, as the landscape changes around a community in their territory. So um, FNHA uh, central staff, just to, to, to speak to some of the other work that's underway, um, are involved in uh, various collaborative and community-led research initiatives, um, addressing both the rapid onset and uh, commute or uh, commute, acute climate uh, driven changes. So uh, like extreme climate events that we talk about, um, uh, but also looking at some of those slower onset changes that communities witness um, and are, have been witnessing over time um, and trying to strengthen understanding of the different um, both direct and indirect implications of those kinds of changes for um, health and wellness from that holistic um, First Nations perspective that is um, something FNHA um, uh, focuses on promoting and highlighting. Um, so in a couple examples of that work would be um, hosting the land-based gatherings um, under the We Walk Together project that people um, may be aware of, um, led through our teams at OCMO, um, also the We All Take Care of the Harvest or Watch project, uh, that is a, a pilot project addressing seafood security and safety um, and sovereignty um, amidst climate change. Um, so, so then in addition to that work that's been underway uh, uh, explicitly in the climate change and health space um, for the past few years, our involvement in the, in, in the CPAS over the past 18 months or so um, has then been um, a, a good catalyst for starting um, internal conversations um, really explicitly around what it means for FNHA to provide programs and services uh, in the context of a changing climate. Um, and so one of the pieces of work this year um, that I'm uh, heavily involved in now is looking at at understanding and articulating what the current scope of FNHA's climate change related work responsibilities portfolios is um, and and the way uh, including things like the way that um, particular climate events um, like the heat dome uh, that we saw in BC or uh, wildfires and flooding events that are um, uh, incurring increasingly and um, with extreme impacts um, what that's meant for FNHA's um, service delivery over the past recent years and, and obviously implications for communities as a result. Um, so the first phase of that is going to include uh, both internal and external engagement with the goal of developing considerations for FNHA's path forward in this space, um, including, including really question of what is the range of possible roles that FNHA can play in supporting communities in their climate health priorities, um, noting that at the same time they're responding to uh, compounding pressures and effects of other pressing health concerns like toxic drug crisis and anti-racism initiatives. Um, so uh, that's one piece. And then certainly as well in that project, looking to identify the actions um, that could be taken to strengthen collaboration at collaborative efforts that FNHA has between uh, with other partners like um, everyone who's on who's presenting in this call today um, so that collectively we're in a position to improve responsiveness to community uh, needs um, you know a key example of that being with the planning and responding to climate events so um, 
this project is definitely in planning stages uh, still at this point, um, but something that if we're all coming together later in, in the year and looking forward to being able to share more on um, as that moves forward. So I think that's probably my few minutes and um, we'll definitely provide um, the organizers with um, contact information for me, uh, as well as some of the like links to some of the projects and programs that I referenced. Um, and happy for anyone to reach out uh, for more specifics. Great, thank you so much, Mary. It's quite, I, I learned quite a bit, and I thought I was kind of fairly well first into some of this stuff. So thank you so much for for that. That's great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to pass it along now to BC CDC. So Adam Cassidy, are you? I am here. There? Yes. You take it we away. There we go. Hi. Hi, everybody. I recognize most of the faces here, but uh, for those I haven't met, uh, my name is Adam Cassidy. I'm a project manager for the BC CDC's new uh, Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Program. Um, so that's the CPAP, as we're calling it. Um, we're a team of three. Angela Yao is also on the call. She's, uh, I think she'll probably have a, put a few in, words in after me here, but uh, yeah, we, um, we just started in January, so we're a fairly new team um, getting up to speed and uh, you know starting to really lay some groundwork for uh, the work that we intend to lead here. So um, also recognizing there are quite a few folks at the BC CDC that have been working on this work for uh, quite a while and um, have a lot of experience in that as well. But I'm here just to talk about um, more more talk about the adaptation work, the uh, work of our of our program. So, um, I guess generally, um, the program is uh, or BCCDC is uh, leading this CPAP program to coordinate um, provincial and regional assessment of climate related health impacts, um, including including uh, coordination of research and uh, building capacity and knowledge across the health system to support collaboration and I guess education um, related to climate risk. So we have um, in, the, in our sort of work area, we have three streams of work um, that we will be, we are leading. Um, so the assessment of climate impacts on health and the health system um, is looking, looking to inform adaptation and service planning. So um, many of the health authorities, the regional health authorities will be or are in the process of developing um, uh, analytical plans for vulnerability and adaptation assessment. Um, and so our role is to really uh, coordinate that work and uh, help with some of the quantitative analysis or the, uh, the methodologies for some of that adaptation or that assessment work. Um, and then also um, coordinating priority research uh, across the province on climate change and public health. Um, so that's sort of one stream of work that we're working on. A second is um, building public and um, health workforce knowledge and capacity to prepare and respond to climate impacts. Um, so the public health piece is um, to work, work, we'll be working with uh, the Ministry of Health and um, other partners, health authorities, FNHA, to um, develop um, public public health communications um, and knowledge translation products to support public education and health protection related to climate risks. Um, so one of the um, activities we're working on currently is uh, coordinating and uh, kind of assessing what's out there and what what sort of gaps exist currently with uh, knowledge translation products um, publicly available that is um, and um, we're also working with the ministry to build uh, health workforce knowledge and capacity so that's i guess um, health practitioners uh, us on the inside um, knowledge and capacity in climate preparedness and adaptation that would be through uh, workshops, webinars, um, and we're in the process of, of uh, laying out or developing a uh, uh, community of practice for um, climate and health here in BC. Um, and so that'll include a 
um, like a virtual platform, sort of like a, a Facebook, I guess, sort of a, a social media almost um, looking platform where folks can gather, um, you know, reach out to individuals one on one, um, hold their own sort of small group sessions, um, as well as convening people to have like a larger, larger room to all talk together, um, provide, you know, share information, um, knowledge, and pose questions, um, just kind of really build a community where um, currently I think a lot of us are, you know, working collaboratively, but um, I guess the, the idea is to reduce the potential for redundancy or uh, align all of our work together and, uh, you know, kind of make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction. Um, so, we're also, I guess, the, the, we're moving on to the, the third. Oh, I should also mention we're um, updating our website. We're building a landing page um, for climate and health with links to um, climate related content across um, different pages on the BC CDC website. So um, that's sort of a first step in uh, building sort of that public facing um, awareness and, and capacity building or knowledge building. Um, and then a third sort of goal or work area is promoting cross sectoral collaboration. Um, I guess I've kind of hinted on this, um, especially with um, the community practice being a, a place to build collaborative relationships and partnerships. Um, uh, yeah, so um, within that, there's a potential for you know building um, sub sort of working groups or implementation focused groups uh, where people can get together uh, for the vulnerability and adaptation assessment sort of process. I think there's going to be a lot of folks working on similar projects. So there's the opportunity to kind of gather um, like-minded or people that have similar interests there. Um, also met this morning with a few folks uh, talking about public communications. And I think um, as we ind individually, like as each agency, as each health authority um, builds out their their work and um, starts engaging with the community. Um, I think we want to have a you know a concerted or a, a consistent message and uh, communication plan. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to uh, to kind of house different groups of people that are working on similar streams of work um, across agencies. So um, that is sort of a whirlwind of uh, of generally what we're doing. Um, but I think I'll pass it over to Angela to fill in any gaps and uh, also just introduce yourself. Thank you, Adam. This is, uh, this is Angela Yao. I am the senior scientist with the CPAP program uh, that Adam was talking about. So um, I think Adam has done a really good job in kind of summarizing the work that we're doing right now. Uh, I think really a goal is to be the hub for uh, technical data and methodology support for uh, health authorities and other partners in the province that are working on climate change and health and um, provide, you know, yeah, support on things like VNA, uh, the assessment and um, are also kind of priority research that's most needed in the province. So um, I'm very happy to be here and um, I'm sure there will be a lot of work that will be kind of collaborating with the health, healthy build environment team as well. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Angela. Uh, so great to meet you and Adam. Um, that's great. It sounds like you're busy or have a lot of plans, <laughs> aspirations, motivation. That's great. Um, that, that's ambition, I guess, is the word. Uh, so that's that's awesome for a team that's just starting up. Uh, that sounds great. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to pass it over to uh, Diana Kutzner now with Northern Health. Diana, are you there? She texted Hi. me that she was, are you there? <laughs> I am here. There it's you sorry. are. Hi. 
uh, just a little bit of multitasking going on today, a little bit too much, but um, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Diana Kutzner. I am the lead for climate change and health at uh, Northern Health Authority. And I'm calling in from the unceded traditional territories of the Klitlitini, um, also known uh, here in the territory as Prince George, um, where I am. And I'd like to acknowledge the 55 First Nations and 11 Métis chartered communities that Northern Health serves across the northern two thirds of British Columbia. And um, because I've had to step away, I'm not quite uh, sure what everybody else covered, but in terms of the questions that um, were shared in anticipation of this meeting, I just wanted to highlight a little bit around um, for Northern Health, the work related to climate change and health has um, really been gaining momentum since 2015, and there's been some background pieces working, um, been underway since then, including several student projects and internships and um, some research collaborations. But it's been very tentative, and uh, the past few years, the focus has really been on emergency response and carbon reduction emissions uh, within NH facilities. And there's now a heightened focus on population health and climate preparedness and adaptation. And um, at Northern Health, we're in the early stages of scoping a climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessment, which will help us better understand the Northern BC population's exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity to climate change health hazards, um, as well as the Northern Health system overall. And uh, one key project or anticipated climate change and health priority in our region that um, I would say uh, is emerging. There are a couple of things. We've got some research projects that we're hoping to participate in looking at adaptive capacity work that's already underway in Northern BC across different sectors, but related to health. And then um, we've got, oh, yeah, probably an internship looking at just pulling out some co-benefits where we can leverage work such as um, um, whichever water or like air pollution type work that might be related to climate change that we can we can support from a northern health perspective or leverage and in terms of key climate change and health hazards anticipated in northern bc we are in the process of identifying the priority hazards uh, that we want to include in the first vulnerability and adaptation assessment uh, but forecasting just extreme weather and climate events including um, um, extreme heat events and cold spells are uh, likely pieces that we're going to be looking at closely. And uh, I'm new to Northern Health myself. I've been living in Prince George for uh, the past 20 years, so I'm familiar with the Northern BC region, but I'm learning lots about the population and health work uh, of Northern Health and that area in general. And I am um, I think I'm learning that the, there are connections to healthy built environments that are a little bit more loosely flame potentially than they are in other health authorities around the province. And so in terms of partnerships and connections, I'm really um, looking forward to staying in touch with this group and building out connections relevant to Northern BC going forward. And uh, I think that's kind of where I'll leave it for now, but happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's a good overview. And yet this is the place to be to get to know people. <laughs> so that's that's awesome. Good. Um, we'll, we'll just save the questions. We'll keep going. Um, so after we have still uh, Katie Hunter is going to speak for Interior Health. And then uh, we also have BCH, Fraser Health and Island Health. Um, and so um, I know you have your times that we were kind of allocated, but if you can try to be brief or, or a little bit shorter than what you were first um, asking or first intended, that would be good. And then we'll have more time for questions at the end. Um, but at the same time, you say what you need to say. <laughs> so um, yeah, so first uh, pass it on to uh, Katie Hunter with Interior Health. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I have a few slides because I'm visual, but I'll keep it brief, Anita. Can I share them? Is that okay? Uh, yes. Um, folk, are you are you able to just share your I can screen, do it. Katie? Yeah, I yeah, can do you it. You got it? Okay. Yeah, okay, for sure. Okay. 
Um, I just wanted to start with a little introduction of myself. So I am the climate change and health lead for Interior Health. Um, I've been in the position for eight months, which feels so quick, but also so long at the same time. Um, my position is situated within the office of the Chief Medical Health Officer. So I work with within the team of the MHOs, and then I work very closely with um, the population health teams as well, which is where my background is. I also was on a healthy, the healthy community development team with Interior Health previously. Um, I just wanted to share the main project that uh, we've been working on since I started in my position, and that's where we've really focused our first year of our CPAS funding. So that's to develop a organization-wide, so IH-wide climate change and sustainability roadmap. So giving us a big picture um, look at where we want to go in terms of our population, health, climate change, adaptation actions, as well as more of our internal um, sustainability and um, internal adaptation actions. So we have three aims of our roadmap. So to build an environmentally sustainable healthcare system, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and minimize negative impacts on the environment, to strengthen our IH healthcare system to adapt to climate change impacts, and then um, also to support IH communities to adapt and mitigate climate change impacts. So really representing the internal work and then the external work. Right now, we're really, really in the thick of our engagement. Um, we've been um, hosting workshops. So we worked with our Aboriginal Partnerships team and um, Mary helped out with FNHA to do a, a workshop for Aboriginal partners, looking at um, vision and priority actions from those perspectives. This week, we just had two workshops looking on how we're strengthening our healthcare system internally. So how are we getting ourselves in order internally? And then how does, do we in turn support communities to adapt? We have a bunch of interviews happening right now, um, as well as a survey out to all our IH staff. And I know there's actually many people on this call who've been involved in the engagement process so far. So thank you, thank you for helping us out. Um, the goal is that we will have a, a roadmap complete and ready for our senior leadership by May. So it's happening fast, but we're very excited to get this first step in order to really um, help us help guide the work we want to do going forward. Um, I just um, want to highlight a few other projects that I thought would be particularly relevant to this audience um, that we're working on. So uh, every year, the medical health officers um, are required to do a, a medical health officer report, an assessment of the health status of their communities. And so for 2023, we're looking to focus that report on climate change, health and well-being. And we're really using it as an opportunity to focus and highlight um, community level action. So looking to show how um, communities in the interior health region are adapting to climate change as well as some mitigation actions. Um, we're also gonna be working on updating our heat and alert response toolkit. So there's an IH heat and alert response toolkit that was developed prior to the BC um, CARS system coming out. So we're looking to update that based on learnings from the past two heat seasons and some project work we've been able to do through Health Canada funding with um, Indigenous partners. And then, like everyone has mentioned, we're also planning to do our vulnerability and adaptation assessment process and figuring out how to scope that and make that work within the capacity we have and how we can use it to support the projects we're working on. And there's my contact information. Was that fast enough, Anita? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. That was that was great. Um, good. I work with Interior Health and I'm learning stuff, so that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Craig Brown with BCH. Um, may I pass it over to you, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. It's wonderful to be here. I promise I didn't pose my dog like that. I never get to work in the room with him. So there he is, Yogi, hanging out with me. He's deaf, so he doesn't know what I'm talking about. 
Um, I'm calling in from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, like Mary and some others, uh, specifically the Sanjis and Esquimalt nations, what's commonly known as Victoria. I'd just say quickly that finding ways to kind of center and celebrate uh, First Nations, Indigenous communities and organizations as they work on climate resilience related activities has been a really like exciting and important part of our work. So just start out by saying that. Um, I'd also just thank you for bringing together this group. This is the first time we've done the uh, climate change and health lead, uh, whatever, the, 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 the show like this. So this is really exciting. I, so many of us have been waiting uh, for a long time for things like this to happen. So it's very cool that this is the venue. I, I'll try and be really brief. So much of what we've done, I, I'm the climate change and health lead at BCH and I've been uh, starting in September 2019, I was we got to lead a health adapt project funded by Health Canada. So Fraser and Vancouver Coastal did a vulnerability assessment and produced a uh, a climate change and health adaptation framework. So you could find that I'm sure it's on the Fraser website as well, but on on ours uh, vch.ca/slash climate change. So there's if you want the background there, but the the rough evolution is that we went from that health adapt project, created a climate change and health lead position. I sit in a newly created team called the Healthy Environments and Climate Change Team, which uh, sits under health protection. And we work really closely with our folks in POP Health uh, from the Healthy Public Policy Unit and others. And of course, just as much as we can with others across public health and across BCH. Um, just a warning that our website like just got updated. So it's not, uh, I can't vouch for its accuracy or anything. I do know that some of the links are on there, but it's, uh, we're in a months long process probably of fine tuning it. Uh, so thanks for your patience. The project, we were asked to just talk to, to a project. I think, uh, well, one that I would flag really quickly is that we're going to uh, produce just like Interior is, uh, uh, we do these annual reports from the Chief Medical Health Officer uh, and ours this year, like theirs, is focusing on climate change and health. So this is going to be a neat container to kind of update our our understanding and our, our data and everything else around climate and health. So stay tuned for that sometime later in the year, summer, late summer, fall. Uh, but the project I wanted to highlight, it's it's um, been made possible by Public Health Agency of BC, who's currently hosting this open request for proposals. If you go to their news section, you'll see this, this RFP. Uh, this work was led, is led, uh, by Elise Miro, my my uh, wonderful colleague in the Healthy uh, Public Policy Unit uh, in the Population Health Team at VCH. And what it is, is it's a really cool opportunity. Uh, the funding came from a variety of sources, and we are now able to uh, hire a consultant to basically find 10 small, medium, community-based organizations uh, that provide support to those people who are most affected during uh, extreme weather events and other climate related uh, situations. Find 10 of those organizations, and I, I, I don't know the project inside and out, so I'm, I'm trying to keep it somewhat general, but we find 10 of those organizations, the consultant works with them to kind of do a high level resilience assessment and produce a plan. Uh, so that's great. That's something that uh, with minimal staff time, they'll now have as an organization, how is my facility, how are my operations gonna be uh, affected by a changing climate? What do we need to do to get ready? The grant also provides a bit of money for them to actually purchase a air filter or air conditioner or something like this. Uh, it produces a business case for, you know, that would have pretty specific information on costing for what that, what that uh, resilience strategy would actually cost to implement. And then, that's something that they can shop around to funders, and it's also something that we, uh, in from an advocacy advocacy position, can also kind of like parcel these ten business cases together and start to build a case for uh, the province and others to start uh, thinking about uh, the opportunity to fund this work at a mass scale. So it feels like a really cool uh, project. It's something different from, you know, we've been doing a lot of assessing and planning and that's super important work and still part of what we do, but it's really nice to have a, a concrete project and to have something where consultants will do a little bit of the work, we'll be strong advisors. We're working really close with, with small and medium community-based organizations. Uh, and so that's, that's a really exciting project. I won't go into more detail there 
other than that, I do encourage you, the RFP is still open until February 28th. So if you knew anybody that was uh, uh, could be a good fit to pursue that kind of work, um, I know there's interest, but it's always great to have more interest. Um, that's all I'll say. You can reach me, Craig Brown, craig.brown at bch.ca or through the website, uh, bch.ca slash climate change. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Craig. Oh, he left. Your dog left at the right time. <laughs> Maybe he can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> he must have known that you were when you stopped speaking. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, so for Fraser Health, I, I saw Sandra. I'm not sure if Amy, you're there as well, but I did see Sandra's, your name is there. Are you able to come on and say hello? Sure. Hi, Anita. Thanks for having us. Um, I look looking at the time you guys gave us uh, two minutes, so we have one minute according to the agenda. So we'll try to go fast. But um, Amy and I will do a little bit of a tag team uh, kind of overview for what's going on in Fraser Health. So um, so much of what Craig was mentioning, um, the climate change work is sitting under health protection for the majority of. of of the activities and tasks that we're working on. So um, I am the climate change uh, manager, I guess, under uh, health protection. And we have um, work right now, we're recruiting for the climate change lead positions. So I think we're a little bit um, sort of behind um, in terms of recruitment, but we'll be interviewing over this next couple of weeks and hopefully have somebody in place uh, very shortly. Um, having said that, we do have a pretty robust group of um, team members that are working on a lot of the climate change activities. So we have um, our our MHO is very involved, uh, myself, our director, Una, Una Kerwin, as well as Amy, who's on the call today here um, in her policy analyst role. We also have onboarded a new environmental health scientist who is supporting some of the work. And some of the work in the local communities have been um, sort of shared between our Healthy Built Environment team, who's been taking most of the lead, and then also our Healthy Living uh, team, which um, some of you may know as a community health specialist. So depending on what's happening and priorities in the areas and communities, we've been trying to, um, uh, I guess, provide that support across Fraser Health region. And um, in terms of um, our projects, Amy will provide a bit of a summary in terms of a couple of things that we're working on. Hi, Sandra. I think, unfortunately, Amy's having some trouble with her audio. I see. Sorry, Amy. I think the audio Let's see here. Ah. Oh. oh, getting closer though, maybe. Looks I'm like you're gonna now, Amy. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you very much. Um, so let me put in there. Um, we thought we'd just share a couple of the projects that We could hear you, or we started to. Can you hear us? I think so, yes. Oh, yeah, we're good. I can hear you. My apologies. <laughs> um, so a couple of the projects that I'm, I'm going to talk about really briefly are just the ones that we think would be uh, of interest to this group, especially in the, the interest of, of partnerships or other things that folks might be doing. So um, you know, for advocacy in particular, we're in the process of creating a, um, an advocacy project uh, developing regulations and guidelines and policies to protect uh, disproportionately impacted populations, um, doing things such as advocating for updates to the building code and strata regulations or rental regulations to include things like the right to cool or air quality considerations. Um, so we might be looking for a partnership if other HAs are also looking to uh, consider advocacy on this. Um, under knowledge translation and, and education, which is a big part of our uh, climate change action plan. Uh, one of the projects we're developing is to do a scan um, of what we have to support staff and public education on climate adaptation and mitigation, uh, including what internal and external groups we reach out to and do a needs assessment to see what we can uh, need to develop or update. Um, so if that's something that other health authorities are looking for. And, and we're also, um, designing an engagement strategy um, to see what uh, what is coming up in the community and how we need to support our community partners.
So th those are some of the projects that we're working on, but there's a larger um, strategy uh, that was based out of the health adapt report that, um, that Craig talked about and um, an action plan that we're working through. So any questions, um, you can reach out to myself or Amy and we'll make sure you're, you get your answers. <laughs> <laughs> of course, great, thank you so much. And of course you can reach out to Shredo and, uh, and myself and we can connect you to anybody um, that's here if, if you've missed someone's name or you don't have their contact information. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, we have Island Health uh, last but not least, um, and uh, to say a few quick words because I think Lois, you've just started with us uh, or with the with the health authority, so uh, or in this I'll position. So please, I'll yeah, my name is Lois Gavitis, and I I'll, I'm speaking to you from the uh, uh, territories of the the speaking people, and I'm excited to be here and to learn with you. And I've kind of made my an announcement of myself by accidentally hitting send and putting my little notes for my update in the everyone, so that'll make it really change. It's essentially Island Health, from my what I understand, is really at the very early stages of setting up our uh, climate hub and up until now it's really been in that built environment so we're really excited to it to to be kind of playing in a new way in in this work um starting with the hiring uh very soon of our um our health of our environmental health scientist and climate action lead so we're just getting going and we look forward to a lot of community engagement in the next uh, few months so thanks great thank you